Hello and welcome back to Beyond Boards, a podcast dedicated to the actions and interests of skaters beyond skateboarding. My guest today, Walker Ryan, grew up near Napa, California, where he started skating. He's traveled extensively throughout the world with Patrick Walner's visual traveling crew. He launched Old Friends in 2015 as a hat and clothing brand and has slowly but surely been focusing on physical therapy, particularly through the Old Friends Catch-Up podcast, which he hosts with fellow skater and physical therapist Dr. Kyle Brown. In 2021, he released his first novel, Top of Mason, and is currently finishing his second novel, which should come out early next year. So here's my conversation with Walker. I hope you'll enjoy it. So I usually start this podcast with just a basic uh, introduction and ask the guest uh, how he or she found skateboarding. So I know a little bit about yourself, at least from the interviews that I've listened to or read that you've done throughout the years. And I know you grew up in Napa or right next to Napa in California. Is that where you started skating or did you start skating elsewhere? I wasn't too sure. Yeah. So St. Helena, Napa is a is a city. And then the Napa Valley is an area with uh, little the wineries. Towns. Yeah. Well, there's yeah, there's like four or five other little towns, and I'm from one of those, and it's called St. Helena. Right. And it's just a, like 20 minutes north of the city of Napa, which is about an hour away from San Francisco, so just to put it in the north, northern California perspective. And yeah, I started skating in St. Helena. I had a friend down the street, kind of like your classic story. I had a friend down the street whose older brother skated. We used his boards. I begged my parents for one, and then it was just an all-out addiction from there. So, What age were you when you started? I was seven. Okay. Oh, so really young. Or okay. really six six, and, you know, like I was almost seven because it was my seventh birthday that I got my first skateboard. Okay. Yeah, and I like to, I mean, I. it's funny because I got my first skateboard and then, you know, started skateboarding in my neighborhood or in front of my house. And then we moved to Tbilisi in Georgia. Right. I wanted to ask Somewhat you about dramatically. that. Yeah. Yeah, so like that summer or it was like a four four or five month period. So I really consider like Georgia where I sort of learned to skate or like really got some of the fundamentals. Like I didn't quite all- learn how to ollie, but it was almost there. Like learned how to ride off little things. And uh, okay. yeah, it's, it's funny because I left my skateboard in that city with like the neighborhood kids. And I just always wondered what happened to that first board. <laughs> oh, yeah, you, you lost it. Okay. I left it with some kids. So okay. Oh, I wouldn't so say I lost it. Yeah. Yeah. Someone used it. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. How long did you live in in Georgia for? Well, my dad was there off and on for like six years, I want to say. And so we would go periodically. And his vision was that we would move there full time. But it was just still a really unstable time in the country. And my mom wasn't very comfortable committing full time. So he would come back and forth. Okay. And we would spend like, you know, three to five months at a time there. But that all ended when I was seven. Basically, after that summer... It just wasn't working out. My dad was part of a winery business. Yeah, like I, I wanted to ask you about that because so so your dad works in the wine. He's like a wine producer or a wine grower. What what exactly was his uh, job over there? Yeah, so he passed away um, about thirteen years ago, but oh, okay. he was a winemaker, and so he he moved from the study of viticulture, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, he moved into vineyard management, and then vineyard management sort of leads its way into just winemaking in the lab right and so uh yeah that was his area of expertise and that was his side of the the joint venture in georgia which was a little before ahead of its time because now georgian wine is like pretty popular all over the world even in the states you can you know bougie restaurant in la and get like some orange wine from georgia right but at the time it was just a little too soon after the soviet union you know capitalism wasn't quite in full effect it was Still there were different figuring motivations. itself out or yeah yeah and there i think his business partners who were in georgia had slightly different motivations for the business and it just didn't really work out it was, okay. it was just a crazy time they would get like held up at gunpoint for the wine and like oh shit it was just kind of crazy yeah but yeah now would have been a good time if he just waited a little bit <laughs> oh yeah for sure i used to work uh in the wine business myself uh not as cool. a winemaker but uh more like a sommelier kind of Oh, nice. 
But yeah, unfortunately, I, I started drinking too much and became mm. an alcoholic and had to quit alcohol two years ago. But yeah, I've definitely had a few wines from Georgia and, and loved them. And they're, it, they're definitely, at least when I was in that business, uh, they were super trendy in Paris and like orange mm -hmm. wines and natural wines from Georgia. And I yeah. think it's actually one of the countries where it kind of originated from like some of the more, the most ancient wines come from that area. So yeah, that was my dad's motivation. It was like, you know, considered the birthplace of winemaking. Right. Varietals right. date back like 8,000 years, some of them, I think. Yeah. So yeah. he just thought it'd be really cool to try it. Spend a bit of time out there. there. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why you guys were living in Napa, I guess, because he, there was a lot of business for him out there. Yeah, exactly. It's just where he got his, his uh, career started. Okay. And so you just told me about starting skateboarding. And when did uh, like kind of sponsorships start happening for you? Did that happen like very early on or was it later uh, around high school time or? Yeah, it was it was early on, but it was it felt like an eternity for me as a as a kid. It was probably yeah. like 14 that I started getting free stuff from a skate shop called Play It Against Sports. And then shortly after a, a board company that Ron Allen owned at the time called Energy. Okay. And so that was like my first year of getting true like free product. And it was amazing. Mm hmm. And so, yes, 14, 15, and then, yeah, there were a bunch of little little sponsors along the way that uh, led me to 510 being my main shop sponsor and Organica being my main board sponsor. And that was when I was like 18. Okay. Things started to feel real. Right. I think I heard somewhere that you were getting expedition boards for a little bit before Organica, or were you always only on Organica? Yeah, it's true. I... Yeah, and I said 18. It was probably more like 17 that I was getting expedition boards. And I had met Adelmo Jr. at skate camp. Mm -hmm. Actually, I initially had handed my tape off to Carl Watson. I was hoping for Organica boards. But Matt Daughters at KO just started sending me expedition. I wasn't going to complain. I was stoked. Yeah. But Adelmo, I had met Delmo a couple times. And he knew somehow that I was getting expedition boards. And he had... Basically, after we we talked, and I can't even remember what the conversation was, but I probably just said something that amounted to like, yeah, I love Organica. Mm -hmm. He went to Matt Daughters and said, no, Walker wants to ride for Organica. And then it just switched. And it was, I kind of love how it happened because it was, it seemed like I wasn't involved, like it was just behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it really worked out for the best. And and at the end of the day, riding for Organica didn't feel that different than riding for Expedition. The KO, what was happening at KO felt like one big company and that was really fun. But I, I loved being a part of the Organica camp. Yeah, it was a sick brand. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it's too bad that it didn't last longer. But uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was a good time. You turned pro over there, right? Yeah. So Organica turned me pro. I was 23, I think. I probably was announced officially when I was 19. So that was like about four years of being a part of their videos and, you know, getting on Circa, which helped having a right. sponsor. And then um, I turned pro shortly after I finished college. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about college too, but you've talked about college a bit here and there in interviews. But yes, yeah, so, so you were in college while you were getting started and, and eventually turned pro pretty much as you finished college, right? Yeah. And I say finished college because I left uh, UCSD, but really I didn't get my degree for like a couple years. I had a few pending units that I just was putting off and kind of messing up, filing them. Mm -hmm. And so I took those at a community college. So I eventually got my degree in 2000, I guess it was 2012, and I turned pro in 2011. So yeah, it was while I was going to school, felt like when I got the bulk of the footage for that video part. Yes, the whole UCSD part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, it was it was called uh, graduation. That was my pro part, and there was some UCSD footage, but it was mainly San Francisco and a lot of just San Diego, Southern California footage. Okay, I think you studied sociology, right? Is that what you? Yeah. And so, at that time, when you when you decided to pick that topic, basically to study, did you have an idea of what you wanted to do with it eventually, or did you just uh, kind of randomly select that and and thought, okay, I'm just going to skate, and we'll see what how things turn out, or Yeah, I was very focused on skating at the time. Yeah. And since I was making money from brands, it was really my main focus where I was hoping my, you know, I would take a career. Mm -hmm. So I really but I didn't want to just quit school. It just didn't seem like that made any sense. And the sociology classes I took early on, I just really enjoyed. And I thought I would be able to apply much of what I learned for the next few years of skating just because I wanted to travel so much. 
And I just remember a class I took. It was on, it was like sociology upper div class that was like the new politics of South Africa. And it was just all about post-apartheid South Africa politics. And I just, I don't know, I liked the way the class was structured. And I just thought if I can take more classes like this, I can really learn about the world. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was, it was worth it. I mean, it definitely, I wasn't thinking at the time what, major am I going to have in order to get a good job straight out of college because I was so focused on yeah on skating. skating so had I not had all the skating stuff going on I may have picked a different path but. right yeah and so you said in other interviews that college wasn't taking too much of your time at least it didn't really uh, bother you for your skating career like you still got to skate and go on trips and stuff and and you managed to do both somewhat easily uh, from what I understood yeah I was and It helped, A, being in San Diego, where much of the industry already was. So mm -hmm. photographers, videographers, and people involved with KO and the other brands I was writing for were, were right there. Right. So I could really take advantage of that. And the fact that it was 2008, 2010 period, when I got on these big companies or these big companies at the time, it was the recession and things were just really slowing down as far as budgets for travel. So there wasn't much traveling happening anyway. So I wasn't yeah. forced to leave school because I had to be on a two week trip here, or two week trip there. Like it was weekend trips, if any. So it was really manageable in that sense. So I was lucky in that way too, that the timing worked out. Mm -hmm. I'm jumping a bit ahead, but then Organica, as we said before, ended um, for different reasons. And I guess you went without a board sponsor for a little bit. And eventually, in I think 2017 or around there, you started getting hooked up by Sovereign. So it's been a few years now. And uh, the team, I guess, has grown quite a bit since, uh, since you got on. How has it been compared to, to Organica, for example? Um, yeah, I don't know if I could compare it. Um, it's very, very different experiences. I got on when I was living in LA and it was a really just like perfect opportunity. The crew was right there. Most of the people are based there. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's just a really good group of guys. I, I really enjoy their company and um, I really like their art direction. You yeah. should probably have uh, Alex on the pod. You could switch between uh, French and English. I know you, I know you yeah. mix it up sometimes, <laughs> yeah, but he's yeah. great. He and Ryan just have a great vision for the brand. And um, yeah, I was just really thrilled to work with them and put together some video projects. Right. Yeah. yeah. Were there ever talks about doing another project after Organica with like some of the guys over there, like Miles Silvis or, or Carl or other people or? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we had At the time, we had built such a big team. We just turned Miles Pro. Josh Matthews was on. Eli Reed was on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Carl Quim and Adelmo still. And it was... Uh, oh, yeah, we had the young guns. We had Zion Wright and Tafari and Lil Dre. We just had like a good thing yeah. going. Um, and Jonathan Perez. It was definitely in the talks of a video. We're definitely in the works. Okay. I listened to your, um, your interview on The Bunt, which was like, I guess, two years ago around there. Yeah. And you, you uh, mentioned a bit your experience with uh, shoe sponsors. And you said that basically, from what I understood, like, especially like skater your own shoe brands weren't as well managed as you would expect. And uh, that was a bit frustrating, I, I guess. How has your experience with uh, shoes been throughout the years? Because I've seen footage of you in various brands like Adidas, uh, Nike, some DVS, of course, S, Circa, of course. Yeah. So yeah, and, and, and are you repping any shoe brand right now? I'm not, I wasn't too sure if you were getting shoes from anybody right now. Yeah, I've pretty much skated every shoe brand <laughs> in skating. Um, no, I, I'm currently getting Nikes, which is great. Okay. I think Nike makes an amazing shoe. Like, I totally understand the hype about the blazer now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Never really got it or like mid top, high tops always freaked me out. But like that shoe is, it's just pretty much all I want to skate. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just, you know, I had started with Circa, was hoping Circa would just, you know, be my shoe sponsor for my career. I'm pretty sure they filed chapter 11, whatever they were doing, they just stopped paying all of us right around the time I got a, my own pro model. Okay. So that was a bummer. And then I was getting free shoes from Adidas. And then I started writing for S. Uh -huh. That was cool to be part of the Soltec camp. But yeah, they basically kicked a couple of us off or told us that they wanted to go in a different direction shortly after the whole thing started, which was a little frustrating uh -huh. because I'd been really excited to be a part of that company. But it was sort of like, actually, we want a different we want a different look for the brand. And it's not you. Was that when they were coming back like a few years yeah. ago? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so that was a little disappointing just because it felt like, all right, I'm not really wanted here. There wasn't any issue. There wasn't anything. It was more of just like an, an image of Skater that they had in mind that mm-hmm. they've been pretty consistent with since, which is fine. And you know, those are all still friends. There's no like that sure. blood there. But yeah, it was a short contract or it didn't last very long. And I, I never liked that feeling of like hopping around. It's just like not a good look. Yeah. But um, yeah, after that, I started skating some Converse and then I got an offer from DVS. And once again, it was like, oh, this is cool. Like, you know, a skate shoe brand that has a long history. Yeah. But those brands, you know, they, some of them at least, the Circas and DVSs, and I'm sure there's a handful of others out there, you know, they, they're perceived as skate shoe brands, but really they're just owned by these like bigger conglomerates. Yeah. And um, those companies pull budgets at will and don't really prioritize skating like maybe the original founders had. Yeah. And so that's what I, I think I meant when I said that on the bunt. It's just believing in the integrity of these skate shoe brands, like they're somehow better than other big corporations is sort of like a silly notion. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's where I was coming from that because what happened with DVS is they about a year into my contract or a year and a half and, you know, shortly before my shoe rollout, again, I designed a pro model shoe yeah, that was yeah, like yeah. we plan to roll out. They were like, oh, we're no, we don't want to pay skaters anymore. <laughs> Okay, cool. That this here we are again. Yeah. And so Over. um yeah. I'm not gonna complain because they were all great opportunities and I met wonderful people throughout each experience. But um yeah, it's just been sort of a I've had a couple couple unlucky rides with the skate shoe brands, but just bad luck, I guess, yeah. Yeah, timing wise, like kinda coming in after their like they've had their like heyday, you know? Like Circa was huge before I got on and they were still really big at the time, but Whatever was happening behind the scenes uh, wasn't working out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if they're still around. They were back for a little bit, but uh, I guess they're probably not around anymore. I don't know. Yeah, they they tried. They had a second wind because I think they... <laughs> I think what happened was the manufacturers were owed so much money that they just took the company and decided to try it themselves. So oh, it's like you okay. had the original owners, they weren't paying for the manufacturing costs. The manufacturer was like, well, we have all so this inventory. Yeah, may as well just, and... yeah, may as well just try the company. And I actually, my pro model ended up coming out as some other shoe. I remember seeing Oh, it really? Like, Wait, that was, the, <laughs> that was my shoe. <laughs> But, you know, that's just the way. So they, they gave it a shot. And I think I had some friends who were a part of that. Uh, and they had a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was always kind of bummed for you about, about that because you, you're such a talented skater. You've been ripping for so long. And to not have a like a proper shoe sponsor, you know, that would kind of stick with you for a long time, like a lot of pro skaters do. Uh, yeah, I guess it's just bad luck, as you said. It, yeah, you went to places where it, it ended up not working out and stuff. But yeah, it's just uh, too bad. Yeah, appreciate that. But it's all good. What do you say? C'est la vie. <laughs> C'est la vie. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> exactly. It's just uh, how it goes. It's all good. <laughs> so um, you've traveled quite a lot throughout your career and your life. You said you grew up between Napa and Georgia and then went to college in San Diego. You lived in San Francisco for a bit. And I think then you went to New York. And I'm not sure where you are actually right now. I wasn't too sure because you're, <laughs> you're always kind of on the move, I guess. But yeah, I was just curious to ask you about, um, yeah, how, how did you get into traveling? Maybe what was your first experience abroad? And then uh, I want to ask you about visual traveling and how you got uh, connected with uh, Patrick and everything. Yeah, I should say, for starters, though, I I grew up in Napa. You know, the Georgia stints were more like little chapters until I was seven. I don't I don't like to claim that I grew up in Georgia. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so my first experience traveling, I guess, was when I was like six months old. And my dad got a, I think he got a harvest job in somewhere in France. Oh, nice. And, you know, took us off there. And, you know, my parents were just big travelers. I mean, I think I went, they went to Russia for a while you know, when I was like two. There's a couple countries I've been to, but I haven't. You know, it's like, oh, I still got to go. Like, I've never been to Russia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, they were just big travelers. And, you know, their attitude was always like, let's, you know, put off the home renovation for another trip. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, even though, you know, I didn't grow up with, you know, a lot of money, there was just always a trip that happened because they, mm-hmm. you know, wanted to try somewhere new. And so that, you know, instilled in me, I would say that attitude about traveling, which is like, fuck it, just go, you know, make it happen. And um, I was very fortunate to discover skateboarding and then, you know, end up doing it professionally because that's all you see in magazines and videos is that skaters are always traveling. So I really wanted that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I just, you know, I didn't do a whole lot of traveling in college. There were a couple trips to Europe, but 
that was, you know, mainly just like a, I would call that a traveling experience just living in Southern California because it, it is pretty different than Northern California, even though, you, you know, you think like, oh, it's the same state, yeah, same yeah, country, yeah. feels like different cultures. For sure. And then, uh, yeah, after basically I finished college or finished my time at UCSD and Kyle Brown invited me to Thailand. Oh, okay. He was writing for a company there, Produce. We'd actually been together in high school. When I was in high school, I went there with him. And so he was like, I'm going to go for like a month. Or he was going for a couple months. And he had to finish a video part. And he asked if I wanted to come. So I came with him. And, and that's where I met Patrick Walner. Okay. Who was like, oh, do you want to go to India in two months? And, you know, I was just like, I was getting paid from skating. I had just moved out of my apartment. I had nowhere to live. So for the next five years or so, I just took the attitude of like, if someone Traveling, asks me, yeah. invites me, I say yes. You know, I <laughs> maneuver fl- plane tickets so I can go from A to B on other people's, you know, <laughs> projects on other or, people's yeah. time. And I just made it work. And fortunately, I met my wife, Whitney, who grew up with kind of the same philosophy or parents who had just traveled a lot. Um, she okay. spent like half her life on a sailboat before she went to school. And, you know, she just has the same attitude. So we're just kind of keeping it going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But to answer your question, currently on the island of Martha's Vineyard, which is East Coast. It's in Massachusetts, right? Yeah. A bit north and east from New York or around there? Yeah. But New York is technically where we live. We just work it out so we sublet our place during the summer so we can travel around the world, basically, and come here. Was it this summer that she went to the south of France or was it last year? I don't remember. Oh, that was last last year. Yeah, Yeah, okay. But this year you went to a bunch of places like islands in Greece with uh, amazing swimming spots and stuff. Yeah, yeah. We're kind of addicted to the Mediterranean right now. It's hard to beat. There's really nowhere else that you can match that sort of swimming. And it's just, you know, you you get kind of hooked. Like the first time we went was actually for Patrick Walner's wedding. He picked a, a random island and we decided to try some others afterwards Mm -hmm. because we were already going. And it's just unbelievable how many there are and how how different yeah. they feel. So so yeah, we started this trip off with a little Greece and um, Copenhagen. Oh yeah, yeah, you were in uh, at Copenhagen Open, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we went to Turkey. We thought we'd try that side. Okay. And then uh, yeah, Zurich and then Sicily. And Sicily, we did some island hopping as well. So nice. Yeah. You just mentioned meeting with uh, Patrick. So was that trip to India the first one you were on together or? Yeah, I mean, if you don't count that trip to Thailand, because he was like, right. we've got to go to Myanmar, and then we got to go to China, let's go to Beijing. So like, I hopped on all these trips with him during that one with Kyle. But yeah, India and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, it was this trip that he made a video out of called Holy Cow. That's right. It's a fun one. That was my first like visual traveling trip. And it was wild. I'm sure. Was that the same? Uh, no, I, I guess that's probably a different trip. But there was one in India where you guys went to like a big uh, festival of some sort. With a... I wasn't on that one. That was called the, that was a uh, Gurus in the Ganges. It was this big Kumbh Mela festival. Okay. And I India had been so intense for me. I just wasn't really interested in going a second. Going time. back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a lot. But that video was incredible. And I after watching it, I really wish I had gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, all the all the um, visual traveling videos are sick and they really make you want to hop on a plane and go to exotic places for sure. Yeah. And so that's kind of a random question, but who are maybe some of your favorite people on the visual traveling crew that you've uh, traveled with? Who are some of the people that you've enjoyed skating with or just rooming with? Uh... I mean, there's no one I haven't enjoyed traveling with, really. They're just such a good group of characters mm-hmm. and great friends. Mishi, Michael Makrot, he was actually on, he was in Thailand too. That first time I met Patrick, uh-huh. he showed up, he popped in to do a fishing lines, which oh, uh, yeah, yeah. was fun to to watch him in action. And he is just a, a big inspiration for his determination and just his personality and his, his balls. I mean, just like the way he just wants to go everywhere and really just has a great attitude and patient for sure. to skating. I mean, Lawrence, Mishi, and... uh Kenny were all on that first trip to India and they sort of remained staples on the trips. Yeah. Traveling with Kenny is obviously was a bucket list for me as a kid. And he's just a great guy. Yeah. We had a very intimate trip together in Iran oh, yeah, uh, yeah. where we were just like, I don't want to say stuck together, but it was like 10 days straight or 
11 of just the two of us in a hotel with a, a guide and no skating. So I really got to know him well during that time. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I mean, just everyone, Phil, there's like always some some random new guys that pop in, especially when Patrick was doing the Red Bull funding. Yeah, for a while, yeah. they weren't really visual traveling trips. They were Red Bull trips, but it was like a way for us to keep it going. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's definitely been a lot of people. Interesting who people. Really enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Traveling with. I wanted to ask you about old friends. So you started the brand in, I think, 2015. And so from what I remember, it started basically as a clothing and, and hat brand and slowly it evolved into like um, more physical therapy, like doing the podcast, Old Friends Catch Up podcast. You also like sell foam rollers and resistance bands and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I just wanted to ask you about how you got started and how did you come up with the name and how did you get that whole project uh, in the works? Yeah, so it was at a time when I basically needed... A hat sponsor. <laughs> okay. Just, why not just make my own hats? I'm always wearing hats and I had just lost mine. Um, it was kind of funny. I was writing for this company called Elm and they were sponsoring skaters, but then they kind of cut their team mm-hmm. and moved more in the direction of manufacturing hats for other brands. Okay. And so it was kind of like, oh, you're not my sponsor anymore, but what if I start a brand and you help me make the hats because you can just do custom designs and it was really they made it really easy Mm -hmm. and so that was kind of it it was just like i want to experiment with business my best friend chris collins he's an artist and he doodled this little hugger graphic and i just thought that's let's let's put that on the hat and Mm -hmm. the the name he came up with was old friends it was going to be like a skate shop and i just thought that would make a good brand name and so yeah we just started there and all along it was kind of just a way to collaborate with our friends who were doing stuff, you know, like I never would have called it like a clothing company because right from the start, we were making weird stuff. Like my friend Andrew made these skateboards out of recycled wine barrels. And so, you know, oh, right. yeah, boards. I remember seeing those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, was so a good idea. Those yeah. Out. yeah, I wanted to put out zines. I wanted to do like we would do pins with my friend Cody, who had a pin company. We would do wallets with my friend Jison, who was making leather wallets. Like it was always just a way to like, let's what, what can we make? And sure, Kyle is a long, you know, like I mentioned, he's been my friend forever, and he had become a doctor of physical therapy. And I just thought, like, why don't we do a collab with Kyle doing like foam rollers? Because no right. one in skating was really making foam rollers, and I liked the idea of calling it a PT pack. Yeah, yeah, foam roller with like more equipment inside. I had been through a knee meniscus, you know, surgery and he helped me get back with like resistance bands. And I was like, oh my God, these are cool. And they're so easy to travel with. And yeah, yeah, there just wasn't anyone in skating making them. So I just thought this would be a fun little corner to try out. And it mm-hmm. it did well. So I just have continued doing it. And then going from there, you know, there's not a lot of useful information out there for skateboarders about injury rehab yeah and kyle i had encouraged kyle to make an instagram to start sharing like little videos and his thing kind of took off and he was having a really fun time with it but there was not really the thorough a discussions about injuries and thorough videos about rehab because a lot of the stuff you can whenever he's treating people it's a lot of stuff you can do at home and so we just worked together to come up with an idea for putting out that information and so that's what we do through what we're calling old friends fitness and Mm -hmm. mainly we're just using patreon right now but we're in the process of switching to a sort of a better easier to navigate platform for that kind of information because it's really helpful there's just not a lot out there coming from skateboarders who understand specifically what is happening when you skate what is happening to the human body when you skate yeah and so yeah the podcast we do is just sort of a way to promote the old friends fitness thing because you know skaters are always getting hurt and they like to talk about their injuries so we kind of make that the focus and yeah there's a lot of podcasts in the space now (laughs) Uh, we try to make ours so it's very specific to injuries and the stories skaters have when they come back from them because there's a lot out there that people like to share and talk about. And it's Interesting helpful. stories, yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's really something that's become a huge topic in skateboarding about, you know, just taking care of your body basically to be able to skate longer because like 20 or 30 years ago, nobody in skating was talking about that. And maybe, and if you did, it was maybe frowned upon or yeah. so uh, it's a really positive thing that now people are addressing that much more. Yeah, it's nice that people in skateboarding are so open 
about much more than they would have been. I feel like the vulnerability has come down a little bit and people are just, or the guard is down. So people are just opening open, up a little bit more transparent about what they're going through in life. And I think that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Do you have any any new episodes of the podcast uh, in the works? Can we expect some other interesting stories coming out soon? Or yeah, we have a we have a few um, on deck, not recorded yet, but people who who've agreed who we're to gonna have on. Yeah, okay. we as I'm sure you know, sometimes you know you get someone who commits and then they flake and then they commit. Yeah. So it's like <laughs> you know, I I commend you for keeping it as consistent as you have with your podcast because that's hard to do. It is hard, <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's cool. Yeah. I look forward to seeing, uh, to listening to more, uh, more interviews for sure. Yeah. And so where do you see, uh, the brand, how do you see it evolve basically? And so now it's been seven years and it's been a big project for you. And I guess it takes a lot of your time. Are you happy of its current status and where do you see it going in the next few years? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I'm really excited to continue pushing the fitness side of it but i'm still open to letting whoever wants to you know use it as a platform to continue doing that you know yeah my friend chris who i'm doing the company with he just had a kid so we've been kind of slowing things down on the uh the apparel side which is okay i, I feel sometimes like being another clothing brand at this time is is just like not that exciting yeah um, and i think he kind of agrees but we'll keep that door open because it's still fun to make make clothing but there's just so much out there yeah i mean i feel like even six years ago when we were making hats not a lot of companies even had hats or or focused on that but now yeah. it's just like it's, yeah it's it's so endless. much yeah so i'm just really excited to keep the fitness stuff going like i said i'm going to be redoing our platform so it's not exclusively on patreon and there's another way to use it and engage with it because we have a lot of content out there and i just want to make sure it's packaged in the best way for people to access mm -hmm. patreon's great because people can you know throw us a couple bucks or subscribe and get access they make it great but it's just i don't love the way that you engage with that platform yeah um, i don't know if you subscribe to anybody on patreon but it's cool and it's really fun to support people but We've put a lot of work into the video content we've produced and podcast content that has a paywall. Mm -hmm. And I just want to kind of clean up how we're, how we're putting that out there to the world. So that's going to be my focus. But yeah, I mean, Old Friends is great because I've also, I also published my book through that. And that yeah, was yeah. really fun because then it's just all, sort of all in one place and easier to manage. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll be putting out another book, hopefully by the end of the year. And okay. then, um, yeah, so I'll just continue using it for those kind of projects. to ask you about the book so i think you released it last year or uh, was it in 2021 yeah it was it was december 2020s but i like to think of it as like that was like a soft release and you know yeah 2021 was when it came out so yeah so i read it i don't remember when but it was a while back and i i kind of went through it again in the last oh, few cool. days before we got together and yeah i really enjoyed it it was fun and uh i wanted to ask you about the writing process because uh, i think i heard maybe in the bun or somewhere else that she started writing it in 2014 yeah that's correct so you were working on that for quite a bit of time and then you released it in 2020 and yeah i just wanted to ask you about maybe what got you into writing a book how did you come up with that concept of you know i guess it's a bit inspired of your life or at least of a pro skater's life and going through different struggles and the character henry is not at all like you he's like going through a rough time and going through addiction and losing his job his girlfriend and trying to get back into skateboarding but it's a bit difficult but yeah just tell me a bit about how you started writing this book basically yeah so in 2014, I had written, worked on a uh, like a pilot for a TV show with my friend Nick that we wanted to put out ourselves. Okay. And we didn't end up pulling it off. It was just a little too difficult with our different schedules to get everybody in one place and try to film it. And, it, you know, but it was a really fun exercise and it just got, you know, kind of the gears rolling for me uh -huh. in creating a fictional world and characters. And so I just started working on my own thing and just kept at it. And I, yeah, I picked this, um, the setting to be San Francisco because it's just kind of where I'm from. Yeah. And it has a long history in skating and there's something unique 
about the city with the hills and yeah, you know, yeah. everything. And I just picked a, the character I wanted to create was inspired by so many of my friends who almost made it in skating. And I just think that's sort of more of an interesting story than the skater who makes it or the skater who made it. Yeah. And that's kind of the direction most narrative stories go in in the you know like tv space or film space or mm -hmm. it's, it's just like about the kid who's trying to make it and i just thought it'd be more interesting to make a story about the guy who already didn't make it yeah and he was kind of like dealing with his life after the fact because there's you know as i'm sure you've you've known them throughout your life a lot of people like almost there's so many people who almost do you know they get sponsors they're like committing all their free time to it and then it just doesn't work out yeah and i just i don't know i just thought that's an interesting dilemma to face when you're in your late 20s and you know i even face it to some extent in just facing the end of a career you know late 20s early 30s like what do you do next yeah and so anyway i just i just thought it would be interesting to make it about a skater who had already pretty much given up and um, he's going through some relationship problems and he just gets into some crazy shit that kind of would only happen in san francisco i mean it's relatable to other places but particularly san francisco and it's i don't want to call it an open open drug policy but there's just a lot happening in that city that is right there in your face whenever you go there downtown uh -huh. tenderloin and so he just kind of the character gets thrown into that world alongside a friend who has been living in that world for a while mm -hmm. and that's another yeah. thing i find interesting is you know the skater who has fallen off and become you know a person experiencing homelessness an addict and so, yeah, it was fun. I mean, it, it. I worked on it for a while. I edited it for a long time. I feel mm -hmm. like I edited it for as long as I wrote it. So it was kind of like, yeah, 2014 was when I started it. But I pretty much, whatever I did for that year, that first year, I scratched and rewrote and then, you know, spent just years editing. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Did you get any help editing the book? Did you have people read it for you and give you an opinion or stuff like that? Or Yeah, I had tons of help. Lots of people read it, lots of eyes on it, lots of suggestions, lots of hard truths I'd have to face with like, you know, killing huge sections of the story or cutting things or restructuring it. Yeah, but I come from a family of novel enthusiasts and mm -hmm. novelists. Like my grandmother has published um, probably like 15 novels and written probably twice as many. Most of the elders in my family, like my mom's side, have written novels. And so there were a lot of people who took the reading part really seriously, not just like, yeah, it was cool, but like, I don't know about that one line. They like really thought about the structure. Uh, my wife was one of the biggest readers of it. She read it probably the most times. Okay. And she's a huge reader. She's not into writing, but she reads enough books to just know like this doesn't work or like this is weird or I don't like this. Mm -hmm. And same with my friend Nick, who I worked on the story with, the original little pilot. He was great. And yeah, so I I didn't get a professional structural editor. I caught, hired a copy editor who was also really effective and just like she was amazing with picking out all the grammatical issues and even plot stuff. So mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was a long, long process, but uh, very rewarding in the end. And uh, did you send it to like editors and stuff or did you how did you decide to put it out there basically? Yeah, I always knew that I was probably going to self-publish it just because I'd done enough research to know how competitive it is and difficult it is to get something published properly. Mm -hmm. So there were like little moments of like, oh, man, this uh, editor is reading it or this person, this agent might want to check it out but like they never went anywhere and i for you know for uh, two years while i was editing it i would send it to people i probably sent it to like 80 agents or something like that and a couple uh publishers mm -hmm. but yeah most people don't even respond and a few gave me some nice you know like oh, that's just not for us so i i was already kind of scheming the plan which was to hire my friend sibo sibo walker to do the cover my friend chris who i do old friends with to do the design and then yeah like i said having old friends and having Shopify, there's this self-publishing site called Lulu and it just made it so incredible to sync them. There's mm -hmm. an app that Shopify offers for that company um, or the company has an app on Shopify. I don't know if you use that site, but uh, it just integrated seamlessly. So so once I uploaded the PDF and all the information, you know, you click a button and it ships anywhere in the world if someone buys it. So it just made yeah. it just like, oh my God, this is so easy. I actually make a decent amount of money per book and 
it was just really satisfying. I like doing it myself. I mean, it was a ton of work, but I felt like I learned so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm going to do it again because it was just like, it was a good time. Yeah, yeah. I want to ask you about the, the second novel you're working on, but uh, I just wanted to ask you about the book again about uh, Top of Mason. So the character Henry runs into a guy called Dev, who's like a famous pro skater. Yeah. Kind of like a Niger Houston or something, someone like that, who's who has a huge reach on Instagram, backed by the coolest sponsors, whatever, super talented. I think he was actually on the same team as him when he was younger or something. So it was kind of like the little protege. And so they run into each other. And uh, I remember reading in the book, uh, you were saying things about like Instagram and social media and the bad sides of it, basically, and how it's not all perfect and, and marvelous and whatever. It's also a bit complicated at times. And uh, and yeah, it was, I was just interested in knowing how have you dealt with social media throughout your career? Because you've been skating for a long time. And like in the early 2000s, there weren't any Instagram or whatever. So it was a different way of dealing with a pro skater career and so yeah so what's your perspective today on social media and how how do you deal with it at this stage of your career maybe yeah i'm i'm glad you took that away from the from the book because that was a fun part of it to explore just this in the story the main character henry who's never had any social media or he's the kind of guy that like made an account but never used it yeah you know he gets because of this super famous skater He gets thrown in like zero to 60, like gets an account made for him, goes viral and just feels that sense of like fame that yeah. comes from social media. That's like really addicting. And, you know, even though fame is like a stupid word for it, it's just this weird like, oh, my God, everyone's like paying attention to me or like watching me or like looking at me. And like, yeah, my relationship with Instagram is very conflicted and social media in general, but particularly Instagram, because that's become our like main media in the industry it's a weird love hate thing it's like some days you hate it it makes you feel like icky and like what have i yeah. done with my day like or the last <laughs> three hours like it makes you feel pretty shitty sometimes like just the whether it's some form of fomo or just like lack of self-worth but then it's also just like really stimulating and really like if you're posting stuff and like people are complimenting you it's just this weird thing like and every skater i feel like deals with it to some extent props to the skaters who've never needed it and don't engage i feel like it speaks to their uh true humility yeah because it's just all about this sort of like feeding your ego and so i just wanted to explore that with the character mm -hmm. and just have him like get a taste like having never had it in the most extreme way because it's just weird you know like i've had videos go like crazy viral mm -hmm. and you're just like you can't stop watching it and you just feel so like confused but like validated and then this mix of stuff that dopamine kind of leaves, hits yeah it's a, it's a dopamine overload that sort yeah. of leaves you drained after a while anyway so yeah it's kind of like one of the other drugs he comes into contact with in the book you know like i'm not a big hard drug person but that's what he dives into yeah. first and then it's sort of after that it's like instagram <laughs> it's just like a, I, i guess i wanted to sort of make that uh parallel yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah it's a problem with our times but it's also just like how you make a career in skating so it's like unavoidable if that is your plan yeah yeah Yeah, because you just mentioned there are a few skaters that don't have an Instagram account, but I guess they're very, very rare. And the best known one I can think of is Wes Kramer. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like today, if you're a young skater, maybe like in your teenage years and trying to come up, do you feel like it's just unavoidable to have an Instagram account? Or do you feel like there's still an avenue for people who would, like Wes, decide like no i'm not gonna fuck with this uh, i'll just do it like the old-fashioned way kind of just climb up the ladder with the help of my sponsors and just put out some cool content and not focus on the social media thing yeah it's definitely possible to make a career out of it i feel like even today you know some of these brands the nikes and vans and stuff they actually like like the guy that doesn't have a big presence um and <laughs> it's kind of ironic because i i feel like there's also a there's safety in it Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe you're not going to get as much promotion, but you, you don't risk this person being like a cancelable person. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're not putting so much of themselves out there as they're like going from 15 to 20, you know, like you, you can do some kooky things as a kid and you can just, if you're always sharing that, I mean, I would it'd be nerve wracking if you're a big corporate brand who got behind someone like that. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there's, 
everything has to be in your corner. Like you have to have the people around you who you're skating with. I mean, I don't think you can do it without YouTube and YouTube yeah. social media. So if someone's putting out amazing YouTube videos of you all the time, that's enough. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's just, and the brands can always be the ones putting skating out of you, you know, even without your own little self-marketing program so Mm -hmm. so you can do it and i I feel like it's always going to be a way i feel like there's probably a lot of guys out there depending on the camp they're a part of who are like or girls too who are like being advised not to do too much social media that too much sharing isn't as good because i think we've learned over the years there's still huge power in like a video coming out that makes an impact Mm -hmm. and it's much more you know impactful when you don't when you haven't seen anything of that person exactly kind of like when we were younger and we would see footage of a gino or someone like that who you haven't seen in five years or something and all of a sudden you see like a two minute part from from a guy like that and you're blown away and that part is so impactful rather than posting some skate park footage or whatever it's a yeah it's a difficult uh yeah so you have to be really you have to be like a special case like You have to have the sponsors who don't seem to care. You have to be in the right place where you're around people who are filming you and seeing you skate so they don't need to see it on Instagram. But if you're just a kid coming up in like some random part of the world, like, yeah, you need that social, you need to be putting out your content. That's how you're going to get, you're going to build your own following to make yourself attractive to sponsors. So it's like, it's going to happen in both ways, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I feel like it's more an exception to the rule. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you also, there have been other skaters like yourself who have written novels. I've interviewed Scott Bourne a while ago, and I liked his book, A Room With No Windows, and I've read some other stuff that he did afterwards. And I wanted to ask you, who are some of the skaters like him and like yourself? Who are some people that you've enjoyed novels or or other writing pieces from? Yeah, hands down, the best dude is uh, Michael Christie. Mike Christie, he's a guy from the old anti-social videos. He's Canadian. He had a really cool part in, I think, the first one. Okay. He is a phenomenal novelist. He's written a book. His first one actually involved skating, but it was more coming of age, like young kid who discovers skating. If I fall, if I die. Okay. And he's just, he's the real deal. Like, he's like, really, I, I really like that book. And then his newest one doesn't have anything to do with skating. It's called Greenwood. Mm-hmm. And it's really, it's amazing. So he, okay. he's cool. awesome. I only found out about him as a writer recently, or not recently, but like in the past five years. And then, yeah, I'd always heard about Scott Bournes. It was a little annoying that his book was like so hard to get. I feel like I had to order it from... <laughs> Amazon France, or... and it was no like France like it had to come oh, really? from like their the publisher in France and it was like expensive. oh okay and uh yeah I would have loved to have just downloaded it on Kindle and read it real quick but he's obviously not that kind of dude yeah kind of guy <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it was cool I mean I I thought it was kind of a miss that he didn't involve skateboarding but mm-hmm. he clearly wanted it to not have anything to do with skating and so that was fine but I feel like his experience is it, it's funny that it like I I read it long after I'd finished Top of Mason, but there are some interesting parallels with sort of this like grimy life in San Francisco that he brings to life. I liked it. And then, um, yeah, Kyle Beachy is is a skateboard writer who wrote a uh, novel back in the day. Also doesn't have anything to do with skating, but his new book, The Most Fun Thing, is a collection of his kind of essays that he's written for different online publications over the years. And it kind of is a memoir. And so that's that's good because he, he offers some, I mean, it's really well done and it offers some critical takes on the industry, which I think is good. Okay. And then, um, yeah, another skater, Jose Vadi, put out a collection of, of essays. A lot of like essays and nonfiction stuff, memoirs, biographies, etc. Right, right. And some good sociology texts that I haven't read. I shouldn't say they're good because I haven't read them, but I'm assuming they are about like skateboarding in the city and skateboarding and urban studies. And, like Ocean and some... Howell. And... Yeah, I believe Ocean Howell. I don't know if his has anything to do with skateboarding, but he's out there. I mean, he's like a college professor, I think, who's doing some great work. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Evan Scheffelbein, actually. Do you remember him from the Blind video? Yeah, yeah super tech guy. Yeah. He wrote a little novella. That was fun to read. Okay. And so tell me about this second novel you're working on. So you said, I think you were expecting it to be done by the end of this year. Do you have like a title? Can you tell me a bit about the story or or do you want to keep it a secret for now? Yeah, I'll say for now that it's a novel with 
separate characters. It's also skateboarding and kind of skateboarding adventure story, Sim- similar kind of vibe as Top of Mason, but it's more inspired by traveling. It's about a professional skateboarder, kind of a modern day Kenny Reed type guy who actually, like we were talking about, is one of the off the grid types when it comes to social media who goes missing. And okay. it's about a, uh, yeah, it's kind of told through what happened. You know, like you see the story unfold, but it's also a podcast about, you know, what happened to this professional skateboarder? How'd he go missing? So, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, awesome. So by the end of this year, you're going to self-edit it again, like you did for Top of Mason? Yeah, so I'm in, uh, you know, pretty much every day I like start my day just like reading through it, but it's pretty much there. I just got to send it off to the copy editor and, and work on the cover and design and everything. Okay. But yeah, it's pretty much there. Since you've been traveling for so long and now you're, you've been traveling this summer and you're in uh, Martha's Vineyard right now in, in NYC sometimes, like when people ask you, where do you live? What do you usually respond? Do you say New York or do you say I'm uh, kind of in between places right now? Or what, what is usually your response? Yeah, I hate that question. <laughs> I feel like I haven't been able to answer that question in the last like 10 years. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I say New York because we actually have a lease there. Okay. <laughs> and even if we're not there that much, I mean, we're still, I feel like we're probably there half the year. It just ends up uh, that we spend time in California and that we spend time in Europe and that we spend time here on Martha's Vineyard. So we're we're all over the place. But yeah, we definitely like live in New York. And before okay. that, we definitely lived in L.A. But we just we have a very um, casual approach to I feel like we're both just very restless and we just really like to keep traveling and keep moving and being in one place for too long is not what we like. So, OK. Do you see yourself settling down, so to speak, in the future? Like, do you think in maybe, I don't know, five or 10 years or something, you'll eventually buy a house somewhere and kind of be there most of the year or something? Or do you feel like you want to live this lifestyle as long as you possibly can? Or Yeah, we'll probably keep this going. I don't know. I mean, I can't say. I'm sure there'll be times um, that we need to be in one place. But uh, yeah, we'll see. Okay. I usually finish uh, this podcast by uh, some friends' questions. Cool. But uh, I have just one last question for me, which is, uh, what would you say is like the most valuable lesson that you feel that, that you've learned from skating? Probably patience and delayed gratification. I mean, I feel like you don't really think about it at the time when you're learning to skate, but you're always filming yourself. And, you know, you learn a new trick, you accomplish something big. There's this feeling of like, I want to share it with the world right now or I want to show it, show everybody. But yeah. even as a kid at 14, 13, y- even younger, you know, you, you get the trick and then you save it for the video. And I feel like that's still how I live my life with skating, obviously. Like I, yeah. you, know, you film something. I mean, a lot of it's you put on Instagram and there's that instinct to do that, but you save things for something bigger in the future. And I feel like I applied that. I like to apply that to so many other things in my life. Just this sort of idea of, all right, be patient, whatever you're excited about, like wait for the right time. Kind of like writing, I guess. Uh, I mean, writing a novel, You uh, even yeah. if you do share it with a few people, but I mean, it's not like you're putting it out there and yeah, definitely. different That's pieces. How I've, yeah. I've applied that that same attitude to writing for sure. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you work on a novel for years and then you, you put it out when the time is right. Yeah. But it's this feeling of like, oh, it's never going to happen or it's going to take forever. But, you know, it's just staying focused and goal oriented. It's just like it's a very rewarding part of skateboarding and a part of life, I want to say. All right, let's finish with the friends questions. So this one is from um, you mentioned him before Adelmo, Adelmo Jr. Oh, six. So he said you did some unique skateboarding. You went to university and followed with a video part in the same school. How was that relationship on studying and thinking about spots for a video part on a daily routine? Well, I'm just going to go with first shout out Adelmo. I love that you reached out to him. I miss Adelmo so much. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, I owe a lot to him. But I'm just going to answer directly, which is I would go to class and walk out the door often to, you know, the the bottom of a, a super famous stair set or something that has been, you know, just a skate spot I w- want to skate all the time. Yeah, yeah. So that relationship was great because it would be so motivating. It'd be like, all right, I'm in school. You know, I don't like really want to be here, but I, it's good. You know, I, I'm making the most of it. But then you walk outside and I was in like a playground for skateboarding. And there were just so many spots that like 
you know, walking in. If I had an hour to kill in between class, I go and like stare at a skate spot that Tom Penny skated to oh, yeah. years before, you know, things like that. So there, there was that relationship, which I loved, which, you know, it was just it was a great time in my life to be physically able to skate most of the time and so i would like you know save up these ideas or get new ideas the second i was out of class because i'm just like walking around this um that school was like a city it was like a small city filled with skate spots um and it was just yeah it was the best there's still so many things i i wanted to go back and do i was like psyched the uh the primitive video oh yeah there were Carlos a few. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. actually the the thumbnail for the youtube link it's he's switch flipping over this bench and then a four block yes. oh that's I that wcsd okay you know, i tried that switch flip like 12 years ago oh really put it down, <laughs> so i was sick to see that but it always re- things like that remind me like oh man there's still so much left to do at that school yeah oh, gotta go back you gotta go switch trade that thing <laughs> <laughs> or something it's so good yeah, yeah. All right, this question is from, I think you mentioned him as well, another visual traveling dude. I'm going to butcher his name. It's Phil Zweisen. I'm not sure how to Zweisen, say that. Yeah. yeah. So he said, I'd like to know how he is always super positive and where he got the drive to always do a lot of different projects. Um, that's nice. He thinks of me as positive because <laughs> I feel like I've definitely been a mopey complainer on some of those VT trips. Um <laughs> What is it? The motivation to work on different projects at once? Yeah, the drive. Yeah, yeah. The drive. Yeah. If you were ask my wife, I don't think that would be a good thing. I feel like <laughs> it makes me kind of a crazy person and spreads myself a little too thin. And I just, yeah, I don't know. It's just a. If I get an idea, I'm just kind of stubborn and I just want to see it through. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of a problem. <laughs> but shout out Phil. I just saw him in Copenhagen and it was so good to see him. He's the man. All right, this one is from Dan Z, Dan Soslavsky. Oh my God, yeah. So he said, aside from your wife, who's your favorite person to film with? (laughs) (laughs) He clearly wants a shout out. Dan, you are (laughs) definitely one of my favorite people to shoot with. Even though he's he's been a little hard to get on the session these days. I lived with Dan for about a year in San Francisco. He was the reason I ended up living somewhere in San Francisco. He had an open room, so it was really perfect. Okay. And yeah, that was like one of the best years for me in skating because it was like being on a thrasher trip every day (laughs) because teams (laughs) would come to San Francisco and he would be the guy to take them around. And so I would just get to piggyback or watch some crazy skating happen. So yeah, Dan, you're one of them, but you don't ever want to skate with me anymore. So uh, (laughs) what's up with that? You're going to have to quit one of... he's He's a serial hobbyist. He's like into sailing or hang gliding or all these other things so okay but really like i feel like filming with someone is such a different relationship than when they shoot photos filming is like a a more intense connection yeah yeah, (laughs) which has been really uh fun to to have going with my wife because she's pretty down she's not always that down but she's, she's she's into it and she's good but yeah there's been so many over the years to say one would be to leave out another. Yeah. I feel bad. But like, yeah, super grateful to every filmer who ever wants to work on something with me. All right. I have a few questions, but I'll just stick with one from Kyle, from Kyle Brown. Okay. So he said, Walker has a history of absolutely horrible luck when it comes to his relationship with computer and media technology. He'll elaborate and explain more when you ask him about it. And it has led him to the brink of his sanity limits on numerous occasions. What are the top, or I guess bottom, three biggest computer or media related meltdowns? Damn, top three computer meltdowns. That's pretty good. Um, (laughs) Yeah, Kyle's seen the worst of it with me, and I feel like I am cursed. I don't want to say it um, because I feel like it's just going to bring on more technological curses. Like, for example, this this program I'm using is probably just going to crash and then everything I've recorded won't work. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that we went through a lot with our podcast. It's just so many, so many issues mm-hmm. with uh, the Adobe suite just failing. The last one that was a true meltdown was Day one in Europe, we were planning to be there for two months and I was going to be doing a lot of work and my hard drive just completely failed, which was horrible because so much so much was on there and there was no backups to access. So that was a pretty big recent meltdown. An early one with Kyle, we made a video when I was like 17 or 16 and man, I, I can't remember what happened with the program, but I'm assuming it was something like, you know, 10 days of work was thrown out the window by a crash and I, oh, damn. I'm pretty sure I punched a hole in the wall. <laughs> which was, uh, not 
something I'm proud of. And yeah, so there's two. And then, um, oh, you know what was a bad one? This was not necessarily technology cursing me. It was just my own problem. But I, I was editing this video called the Shuffle video, which we put out in 2010. Okay. And I had just poured like half a wine bottle into a beer mug. And I just sat down to edit and I just fumbled with the glass and poured the entire glass of wine onto my computer and just completely crashed it and lost so much <laughs> lost so much work. <laughs> wow. And uh, I just remember taking it into the into the Apple store and it just reeked of wine and it was like <laughs> not like I was about to pull off any kind of valid excuse for it. It, not it was it yeah. was clear what I'd done. But yeah, he's right. I got some bad luck and my wife will attest to that. <laughs> Okay, well, let, let's hope you don't get too many of those in the near future. Yeah. <laughs> Especially in the next 20 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> fingers crossed. All right, this one is from Jimmy Carlin. Damn, you dug around. I like this. So he said, while you were in college at UCSD, was starting a career in skateboarding your primary choice? And was it difficult to multitask between the two? Shout out Jimmy Carlin. He's a late bloomer in the academic sense, and but he's, you should get him on because he's about to be a school teacher and it's really cool. Yeah, I super rad. It. Yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely like skating was the dream and school was what I was doing, you know. So it was like two sides of my brain were working at all times. Like, all right, what's most practical for school and what can I do to make this dream happen? Right. And, you know, the dream sort of took over. So I was really prioritizing making the skate thing happen because it felt like once in a lifetime, small window. And so, yeah, yeah I would say that took over. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure you've, this is a theme you've had with most of your interviews is that, you know, skating, it's really hard to make skating the only thing you're doing. Well, yeah. You're always sure. going to be doing something else. And I've always done something else alongside skating. So it really was not that big of a deal to go to college while I was skating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I enjoyed it. All right. So let's do the, the audio ones. Hey, Walker. My surprise question for you is why you think you have such an easy time turning switch backside. Is it Jiro? Yeah. Oh my god, Jiro. <laughs> That's so funny. So Jiro Platt, is that his last name? Yeah, Jiro is the, the homie in New York. Super oh good god. skater from what New York City. So what was his question? Yeah, he's he's incredible. What's the question? So it's basically, how, how are you so comfortable turning switch backside? Like you do a lot of switch backside flips, switch big spins. Yeah. Um, I try to tell him all the time when we're skating, he just needs to turn his shoulders. I think he's just looking for a tip. No, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it is kind of weird. It's just always been a little more natural. Mm -hmm. And if I were to answer like, seriously, I would just say like, I think landing regular is the high incentive. For some reason, it's really hard for me to turn switch front side, but really back side. Yeah. I, I don't really have those tricks. I, I like under rotate or something like that. It's weird. I feel like I see more people do the switch front side flips mm -hmm. or switch front side 360s or whatever than uh, yeah. back side. I definitely would feel more comfortable going switch front side than switch back side. So. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what it is. I think I'm like Zoolander. I just can't turn right. <laughs> That's a good answer. Yeah. Let's see. Let's do this one. Hi, Walker. You've traveled to a lot of places with skateboarding. So I wanted to ask, what were the best and worst places you've been to on the planet in terms of skateboarding? Lawrence. Yes. Larry's, like like I said, the go-to with the VT trips. Best would have to be really China in the beginning. Like when I first went there a few times, I mean, going to Shenzhen, going to Beijing and uh -huh. some of the other cities, like it just felt endless and perfect. Yeah. I feel like I probably wouldn't say that now but it's still just the first thing that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the easiest because it was tricky to get around. You know, no one speaks English. It's definitely a culture shock, but yeah. Those early trips to China were really, really crazy, as I'm sure most pro skaters can attest. Yeah. And then uh, worst was definitely Bangladesh with Lawrence, and I'm sure oh, yeah. he, he would agree too. It was like really, really rough. Mainly because I was dealing with some serious food poisoning, but oh, yeah. it was just pretty funny what we would decide to skate. Be like, oh, this like this car that's like been rotting here on the side of the road. It's kind of a spot, right? <laughs> this pipe. Let's skate this pipe. Like there just wasn't very much. You had to get super creative. Yeah. Desperate is the better word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shout out, Larry. Okay. Two last ones. Let's see. 
Walker, in your new upcoming novel, uh, you have a character that is really into collecting cookbooks and recipes. <laughs> and what I wanted to know is over the years of traveling to Europe, Asia, and different parts of Africa, what would you say has been your favorite dish? What do you... um? What does your taste buds itch for when you're hopping on an airplane heading out east, west, or south from, uh, from JFK? All right, that was Patrick Wallner. Yep. Really great question. You know, I feel like it comes back to my first time with Patrick, which is Thailand. And the like easy spicy fried rice you'd get for like a dollar on the side of the street. It's so basic, but it's just still this this meal that brings so much joy. I had it the other night here in on Martha's Vineyard and it you know, it's like a $20 dish, but it's just like that feeling I just love. And then, yeah, there was on that same trip, we went to the north of Thailand, Chiang Mai, and there was this, this like soup, spicy soup dish. It's not really soup. It's like a noodle soup, I think. Um, mm-hmm. Khao soy, I think is what it's called. That remains up there as one of my favorite meals. So yeah, the cow soy probably wouldn't have happened with Patrick. So I think he's looking for a little compliment there, which is <laughs> okay. Patrick's the man. Thank you for getting me all over the world. Oh, yeah. There's some other stuff, though. Like, I'll say one other that, like, rings that I think of when I think of Patrick is hachapuri, which is a Georgian dish, which I remember oh, yeah, eating yeah, yeah, as yeah. a kid because it has this really, like, strong cheese. But if you have it right now, it's incredible. It's so good. All right. Very last one. Hey, what's up, Walker? It's your good buddy, Carl, here. And I have a question for you. You seem to never age. You stay young. You stay spry on your board. You you always look good. You are literally fine wine. Is traveling the world your secret to staying young? Or do you think it's the fountain of youth that skateboarding provides? Shout out, Carl. It's actually friendship with Carl that keeps me <laughs> Real talk, though. He is one of those inspiring people who it's like, how do you keep this happy go lucky approach to life like oh, yeah. really he's really someone uh i'm thankful who i got to i got to know when i was young i mean he was a hero of mine as a kid and uh but i don't know i feel like i'm aging i'm 34 i feel it every time i uh i Jump go skate i mean i am or... yeah i don't know it's nice that he'd say that but it's it's not something i feel but i definitely think he's onto something though there is a little bit of a of a fountain of youth with skateboarding it keeps you keeps you young it keeps you um, excited, and mm-hmm. I'm sure anyone who's listening who skates can agree. Yeah, for sure. Even if it's constantly, like, destroying your body yeah. in some ways. But, uh, yeah, no, I've been trying to maintain things when I'm not skating much more these days, which uh, involves, like, you know, strengthening workouts and little little things like that that Kyle throws at me. Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, any skater over 30 knows you start to feel it. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Walker. Well, thanks so much for making the time and making it happen. It's like we did it. That's it for my conversation with Walker. Follow him on Instagram at Walker Ryan and all friends double underscore. Go visit allfriendsandco.com to buy some of their merch, including Walker's first novel, Top of Mason. And while you're on there, check out the Old Friends Catch Up podcast with many insightful interviews of skaters that have gone through various injuries. Go watch some of Walker's old video parts and visual traveling trips he's been on. I'll put some links up in the description. Lastly, keep your eyes open for Walker's second novel, which should come out early 2023. Thank you for tuning in. See you soon for a new episode of Beyond Boards.